Thank you to APF for, for letting me uh, kick off this webinar. It's a presentation that I'm very excited to see and one that I unfortunately missed at our conference. Um, my name is Ariana Urban. I am the planner and certified local government coordinator over at the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I wanna say thank you, of course, to everyone APF and, and City of Flagstaff who, who has worked to put this webinar together. Um, like I said, I, I work at the State Historic Preservation Office or SHPO as we call it. Um, and as our presentation today comes from the incredible City of Flagstaff, our friends at APF just asked me to say a few words about uh, local governments and preservation in Arizona. So uh, just, just as an overview, the, the structure about, of historic preservation in the United States is based on a collaboration between the federal government at the top, the National Park Service, then the, the state government or the SHPOs in the middle, and then the local governments, um, not at the bottom, but but at the, the tier that's really closest to, to our local preservation resources and the preservation community. So um, Arizona currently has 30 uh, local governments that we work with in our certified local government program, which uh, are incorporated cities or counties that have by, by ordinance and by show of community support uh, made historic preservation really part of their local planning, uh, development, redevelopment processes. So um, being a CLG is really great because like I said, it's a real demonstration of, of commitment to historic preservation by the community and uh, the, the city themselves, city administration and their local mayor and councils. Um, and uh, it's also just really great to provide an uh, opportunity for assistance from both the federal, state, and local governments in, in your preservation planning processes. So at SHPO, I am just really thrilled and honored to be able to sit in the middle of, of the federal and local processes and do my best to facilitate uh, and act as the liaison between the Park Service, which does have funding available for, for these certified local governments, in order to carry out preservation planning projects and uh, oh, to no, act as liaison with the CLGs themselves, who really ineffectively form the, the real backbone of historic preservation in Arizona. So um, being a local government also gives you the opportunity for training for staff, um, for preservation commissioners, and for even the community. Um, and that's another thing that, that my role at SHPO is, I'm, I'm so happy to collaborate with. So um, very excited to, to be hearing from Flagstaff today. And uh, one of our star CLGs, Flagstaff has done an incredible job with their preservation programs and all of their, their efforts from the staff and the community. So I will turn it back over to Alicia. Um, thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Ariana. We appreciate yeah. it. Um, hello everyone, my name is Alicia Adolph and I'm an AmeriCorps public ally placed with Arizona Preservation Foundation. Um, today's webinar is titled Flagstaff, Crossroads of Heritage, Tribes, Camels, Trains, Lumberjacks, Route 66, and a Path to the Moon. And the recording will be added to our YouTube channel today after today's session. At any time during the webinar, be sure to add your questions in the chat for our Q&A that will follow the presentation. And I'm excited to present to you our speaker, Mark Rivas. Mark Rivas is a heritage preservation officer, neighborhood planner for the city of Flagstaff, where he is responsible for compliance with city ordinances for national register districts within Flagstaff and for section 106 reviews for federal undertakings, among much more. He also works for community preservation design, which is an architecture and community planning and design firm specializing and preserving unique quality of life aspects of the Rocky Mountain region through creative, comprehensive, and affordable, implementable designs. Without further ado, Mark. And everybody hear me and everybody see my shared screen? That is great in this technology world. Um, this uh, is a presentation that because of a few little technical difficulties, I wasn't able to give at the preservation conference in Yuma, but we'll take it from here. 
again, it's a cultural crossroads. I'm not going to get really so deep into this world that uh, I'm going to discuss the meaning of life, but I, I do contemplate uh, things about uh, preservation, where we are in this world. And again, things are moving quickly. Our, uh, you know, our place in the universe, our increased knowledge being compounded every day from telescopes flying out in space to uh, things moving quite quickly for us. But it's good to know where you are in this uh, this galaxy and in our solar system and where we are. And where I am right now is uh, the crossroads. So Flagstaff is certainly a crossroads of travel, transportation, of well-known places such as the Grand Canyon. And of course, everybody thinks about getting your kicks on Route 66. And there are certainly a lot of interesting things immediately in this area that have to do with uh, cultural heritage that intersect here at Flagstaff and its crossroads. I've only been here three years. I kind of took a, a route from quite a few uh, decades in Butte, Montana, then Silverton, Colorado, and ended up here in Flagstaff. And these are things that surprised me that I didn't know about. So the tallest mountain in North America was San Francisco Mountain that blew up about 40,000 years ago. So these distinctive peaks that everybody talks about and skis on uh, did a Mount St. Helens type of thing where it blew up. So if you look at the remnants of Mount St. Helens, and I kind of looked up there and I went, oh, that's familiar. So that view of the San Francisco peaks would have been quite different 40,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, sorry. About 50,000 years ago, this uh, visitor came screaming into the east and ended up impacting a very flat piece of earth east of Flagstaff. The visitor was only about 148 feet in size, but managed to excavate 175 million tons of rock. If you haven't been there, it's a very impressive sight. And we can talk a little bit more, but uh, these guys up in the upper left, uh, they were people that walked on the moon and they spent a considerable amount of time in Flagstaff and at that crater. Also thinking about, uh, you know, uh, us as human beings and what we did and how we explored communicating uh, things such as graffiti on walls. We find out that right next door to Arizona and New Mexico, about 21,000, 23,000 years ago, uh, at the end of the Ice Age, that we had people walking around throwing spears at giant sloths and mammoths, and that there were fuzzy camels. And there's evidence of footprints and new dance steps being created here just east of us. Camels. This is one of those surprising things for me. Um, camels are origin they originate in North America and they left North America about 13,000 years ago. Uh, some of their descendants headed uh, south and kind of became those uh, llama type animals. Uh, upper right here, uh, old Joe, he left uh, later on. So heritage preservation is a, is a very important aspect of community planning as a CLG. Uh, we incorporate it into all of our efforts to make sure that we are thinking uh, about the best public interest in preserving our cultural heritage through education, uh, through scientific efforts. Uh, we have many things going on where we acknowledge uh, our heritage in this area. Uh, immediately in Flagstaff and in the surrounds, we have extensive resources that we have. 
sort of a complex patchwork of what we have. We have historic overlay zones with some design review requirements. Uh, we have uh, national register districts that span the railroad to uh, different residential areas that have uh, a certain unique character and also individual uh, listed sites in the core of our downtown. Each one of our districts has a certain feel to it, uh, had a certain ethnicity associated with it as well. And certainly our historic resources are an economic driver. Uh, it's very apparent uh, during the summer season that people are coming up to experience like that. We have a solid relationship with the county and their historic resources. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're doing a regional planning effort together, so we fully acknowledge uh, what took place in the county as well. So I've been doing this preservation thing for quite a while. The one thing I wasn't uh, doing and I didn't have much exposure to, which has been great about being in Flagstaff, is the archeological resources that exist right in the middle of Flagstaff. Um, I won't disclose where this is, but housing developments uh, have found important historic resources and artifacts when uh, development projects take place. And I'm very aware of that. And we make sure that we are protecting those resources and documenting them when they are found. Uh, certainly indigenous people and that history, we feel that uh, Flagstaff, uh, and we do know that Flagstaff was that central gathering point for major powwows and also habitation of multiple tribes uh, that developed in this area. We've made a, a really great step forward in acknowledging our indigenous uh, ancestry that exists here. And we had a pretty exciting planning project where our old historic stone uh, building that was for fleet maintenance has been targeted for an indigenous cultural community center uh, that's uh, just south of Thorpe Park and it'll be absorbed into Thorpe Park if anybody's familiar with our major regional park. So certainly the cultural landscape, uh, that visual landscape uh, has multiple uh, indigenous nations that want it to be protected and respected. Back to this crossroads thing that exists here. Uh, these are some pretty familiar routes. And there is evidence of trade all the way from California, uh, seashells to Mexico. They pretty much follow the current roads, routes that everybody else is using at this time. Dark sky, you hear about that a lot, but uh, they're protecting the dark sky in Flagstaff because our, our observatories, uh, 1989, uh, we, there was ordinances and 2001, uh, first international dark sky city. So community is very serious about maintaining dark sky. Dark sky has been critical throughout our history from indigenous people to Percival Lowell, to uh, tracking where we are uh, time-wise, uh, and uh, where our place is on the earth. And also we'll link it to uh, high-end technology at the end here. So people are familiar with Western astrology, astronomy, those things kind of all go together. Uh, the indigenous people were very much aware and there's a whole lot of similarities between uh, these constellations, telling stories, representing things. And again, the, the North Star, they're fully aware of, of how the patterns of, of the dark sky uh, affected where they were in time. Understanding uh, how that locked into cultural and tracking time and when uh, anywhere from hunting to the agriculture that took place. Uh, was important and affected by the ability to look at a dark sky, something that we have lost, a lot of people have lost 
without a dark sky to look at. We have a very unique uh, aspect park, which is Picture Canyon, where you can actually go and look at these pictographs, uh, get a close-up view, understanding uh, the people that were inhabiting this area. I talked about those crossroads, again, just east and heading north out of Flagstaff is uh, the Eldon Pueblo remains. And there's evidence again that this was like a central trading post. Of course, it's time to talk about Hawaiian lavatites, correct? Why not interject that? Well, there's Pohoihoi and A'a, and Pohoihoi is kind of that leathery uh, type of look, and A'a is that kind of crusty, beat up sort of look. And down in the lower right, you might think that's Hawaii, but I can tell you, it's just east of town. Uh, this is about 900 plus years ago is what this area looked like. There was lava flows, cinder cones, uh, dust falling everywhere. It really gets you an idea that it's surprising how thin the Earth's crust is. And it's an absolutely beautiful area if you have not gone to Sunset Crater and walked through that landscape. It's certainly my favorite landscape, this interface between our, our forests and the fauna and this really hardened edge that exists in this area. Cinder cones, when you go through this area, and it is definitely uh, a moonscape that exists here. That ashfall actually had a beneficial effect to uh, some fairly established agriculture uh, north and east of Flagstaff. If you haven't gone to this national monument, it's really impressive. And it, what really impresses me is that the use of this native stone and how aware they were of the structural aspects of utilizing stone. It's it's really very beautiful when you go and look at that uh, site and how it, it's set against the landscape and where they placed uh, these uh, areas uh, being able to watch and protect themselves. Immediately, uh, uh, very much adjacent to uh, Flagstaff is Walnut Canyon National Monument. Uh, the Sinegua term without water, uh, they made an extensive uh, development of housing. This is certainly worth visiting. Uh, I think uh, the term without water was the fact that the women were out there bringing all the water up from the bottom of the canyon and nobody realized that that's where they were getting the water from. Wasn't treated very good early on. Uh, there are a lot of people taking artifacts out, but again, there was a realization in the 30s that this was a very important site and that protections were implemented and it became an important uh, civilian conservation uh, project. And if you see the amount of steps and the amount of concrete that was poured to access this site, it's pretty incredible. I've also never figured out why there's more steps coming out of the canyon than there is going down. Take your water and take a deep breath. So trails, wagon roads, railroads, uh, roads and interstates, uh, there's a progression here of how people accessed and used this main route to the East Coast, I mean, to the West Coast of California along the way. The one that really surprises me is this, a camel train and this man, uh, Lieutenant Edward Beale. Uh, he was a absolute true believer in the utilization of camels along the way. So remnants of the Beale wagon trail exist that you can take in Flagstaff. They did tend to follow some of the springs, even though these uh, of uh, ships of the desert uh, were were just perfect. He thought they were much, much better than a horse. 
they didn't need any water. They just chewed on stuff along the way and certainly a face that only a mother can love. He was also a true believer that they were useful for the US mail and they actually did carry some mail along the way. The railroad did replace that wagon uh, route that was that utilized camels. That pretty much changed a lot of history in Flagstaff and also started this major push for timber industry. Uh, people like the Babbitt brothers uh, developed anywhere from ranching to mercantiles. And of course, a boom town arrived. This history is uh, often typical of other histories in the West uh, where the original town site burned down and shifted to the east of what you're seeing now in Flagstaff. Again, those peaks behind Flagstaff and this boom town is often something that people think about uh, Western history. So there was, you know, go west young man and then quite a few people stayed and did make their fortunes uh, in this area. Some people that I found surprising. So Seahart Merriam established a base camp north of Flagstaff and he was the predecessor of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And you would think everybody would kind of know and get about this concept of life zones, but nobody ever uh, put it down in writing and really took a good look at it. So there's a small plaque at this location, but this guy was a, a major scientist that understood that different things grew when I, when I think about driving from Flagstaff down to Phoenix, you watch that progression of how things change, how they're oriented, uh, what the, the biomes are that exist. So this concept was not really ever written down and recorded. And he was instrumental in understanding and ultimately protecting resources. One of my favorite guys is this Percival Lowell. Uh, where he had a fair amount of money. He was absolutely uh, fascinated by Mars. Uh, purchased telescopes, went on a search for finding the best place to view. To His term was to see. Uh, so high altitude, clear sky, that was his uh, obsession. And by looking through his telescope, he was absolutely convinced that these uh, lines were actually canals that were made by somebody. So without Percival, our science fiction would have been pretty dry. It sparked a lot of people's imagination that there were uh, men from Mars that existed. Again, he wasn't so wrong about the fact that um, he believed there were water and we are finding out that there was certainly water. Very impressive wooden structures, uh, these domes, the Clark Dome you're seeing here. And there's Percival looking into his large telescope. Uh, night sky preserved and actually old Percy himself is buried up there. That's a picture of his mausoleum that's up on the site in a collection of other uh, telescopes that exist at this site. Multiple telescopes and a whole lot of scientific discovery up there. Excuse me for a second. Then there's Pluto, and there's a, a key person, Clyde Tombaugh, that a uh, young scientist in his little tiny uh, telescope observatory that's up there at the observatory. Here he is walking in, uh, where he patiently took photos of the night sky and then would view them in this kind of stereoscopic thing to see what was moving in the night sky. And uh, he took some photos. Uh, he went to a movie down at the Orpheum Theater in Flagstaff and came back, saw this movement and found that, that ninth planet that everybody was looking for. And uh, he has passed away. He was put into a little container and attached 
to the New Horizon flyby, and we got the best absolute pictures of Pluto. How can you not love a planet that has a heart that's associated with it? And again, uh, Disney's Pluto was named after they found Pluto, but poor Pluto has been promoted to a dwarf planet and not one of our major planets anymore. Sandbar and fire insurance maps are really important for us uh, to understand what, what, what did exist, such as the Reardon Mill was a huge area when you're on Route 66. Now it's some housing and car dealerships. Uh, to see that extensive amount of, of industry that was there, that huge timber industry that Flagstaff had, to where there's hardly any remnants that remain associated with that mill. Another unique thing is that when you look at the size of that and you also look at the faces, uh, the ethnicity mix of, of this community was much different than most people think. So, you know, our, our uh, typical look of our rugged man and even our logo for our NAU uh, is probably not represented very well. Uh, many, many of the lumberjacks out in the forest were African-American. And we've aimed for telling that story that they were instrumental part of that area. And they certainly lived in uh, the south side of the tracks, the south side historic district in those vernacular homes along with Hispanic uh, lumber workers as well. Um, this discussion always makes me uncomfortable and even the term uh, Negro Motorist Green Book. But if people are not familiar with the Green Book, uh, it was a, a guide to where it was safe for African Americans to stay and not be harassed and were allowed to stay in motels on their travels. Um, thinking about uh, Nat King Cole's uh, famous tradition of, you know, get your kicks on Route 66, uh, Nat King Cole probably wouldn't have been welcomed uh, if he had not stayed in an area that was noted in a green book. And we have a very intact area of rooming houses and green book motels. So Route 66 didn't stay on the north side of the tracks. It actually crossed the tracks on San Francisco Street and followed along Phoenix. So we have a multi-block area where we have rooming houses and Green Book motels that are very much intact that represent that, uh, travel through the area, safe travel. Basque, uh, we're here uh, after being thrown out in the middle of a field herding sheep. We have architecture and also a handball court remains that represent the Basque people uh, that were instrumental in Flagstaff as well. And we're also in the south side ethnic neighborhood. Small remnant of Chinese, again, uh, Wong family, Chinese laundry. If you go to one of our, our famous breweries, the Mother Old Brewery, you'll note that that architecture was uh, steam laundry and why that uh, upper area with venable uh, glass was there because of that uh, laundry business. So small representation of architecture uh, in Flagstaff, the Chinese community. Scientific resources, this is a huge thing that I don't know if everybody's aware of that took place here. So when we talk about the US Naval Observatory, people will say, well, it exists in Washington, DC. It's actually where the vice president's home is. But officially, it was actually moved west of Flagstaff in 1955. So how did we navigate in this world without these satellites and this handy little thing that we have in our pockets? Well, we looked at the stars like everybody had done. So again, that dark sky uh, is super important to the United States, the development and being able to navigate and do all the things that we're able to do now with satellites. County Historic Districts, uh, out there in Sunset Crater is actually an Apollo mission testing training district. It's out in that landscape that I love to visit. 
So when you look up at the moon at a full moon, you go, well, that, that uh, moon must be pretty white. It's not. It's actually very, very dark gray. And the perfect simulation for what they were going to encounter on the moon is actually right here around Flagstaff. So a whole lot of similarities and why the training took place here. What's unique about uh, Meteor Crater is the fact when, why did they, why were they so interested? When this impactor hits, it actually flips the soil over. So they didn't have to excavate. They just went to the edge of the crater and the soil was flipped over and they were able to evaluate some deeper aspects of the moon surface. This is one of my favorite people, uh, Tricia Bridges. She uh, would take photos that were observed through the Clark Telescope at Lowell Observatory, and she would actually airbrush these amazing maps that were used to determine where to land on the moon. So it was a group effort, but she was certainly this incredible artist that was able to depict what the moonscape was going to be like. And one of my absolute favorite things here is north of town, these uh, flat uh, crater, uh, cratered areas uh, were developed to simulate the moon. So this lower right picture, you have simulated blown up surface of the cinders that exist around Flagstaff. And on the right of that lower left picture, that's an actual uh, picture of the moon. So they're a really good match. So they went out there with dynamite, they mapped everything off, they blew up the area, and they recreated the moon surface for training. So old Neil here, he actually had a pretty good idea of what he was looking for and what he was going to land on. Bill here, he uh, was instrumental in looking at a various concepts he actually developed a test vehicle for uh, the moon when they had the moon rover. It ended up being called Grover. And uh, they drove this little electric vehicle around to test out how effective it would be. And it was actually assembled and built in an overhead door company building just in the Sunnyside District area of Flagstaff. He got to blow up stuff too. So this whole story of astronauts training, the people that walked on the moon, all interrelated to the United States Geological Service, knowing what they were looking for, uh, testing on how things worked, how you picked up rocks, and understanding where they were going to land. So this whole um, moon thing that has taken 50 years to get back to uh, was a whole lot of things came together to understanding what was going to take place uh, on the moon and preparing for that. They finally got it right. It was pretty silly that they named it the Apollo mission. It should have been Artemis. It should have been the twin sister. Artemis is associated with the moon, not Apollo. So they've corrected that a little bit. Transportation corridor, if you ever come to uh, Flagstaff, you'll notice that. Uh, considerable amount of travel from the East Coast. And this containerized uh, train that looks about a mile long when it comes through with multiple locomotives is a principal part of being on that crossroad still. So when we talk about heritage preservation, it's very diverse here. I'd like to kind of show you what my philosophy is about uh, developing uh, historic resources and taking the historic information that we collect in like cultural resource reports and trying to return that value back to the community as something really important. So heritage development means that a community identifies the stories and places that define their past and sense of identity and then use them as a tool for community revitalization and growth. So we're gonna lose this little unique uh, trestle, this railroad spur trestle that was associated with the uh, Arizona Pacific and it was converted into a pedestrian bridge. 
uh, because of solving flood problems, we're going to lose this uh, small little bridge that's kind of unique. So knowing that you're going to do that, knowing that you go through the Section 106 review process, how do you return that value back to the public? And one of the uh, things that I think are super important is that you look at developing sites that use interpretation as well as the potential for art that's associated to uh, communicate that feeling of what took place here. So this was a little replacement uh, concrete bridge that we uh, recreated the details that uh, were on that bridge when it was recently replaced. Uh, communicating with the Army Corps engineers that has to do historic compliance, that we do want interpretive plaques, and that we are planning on integrating that with an art component. Then we have people that are quite uh, unique uh, in uncovering their history. Uh, we have a woman here that's uh, in the center of the Arizona State flag. She was instrumental in taking early, early pictures of Flagstaff, one on the left here, looking up at the San Francisco peaks. Uh, she was the daughter of an owner, a woman that owned two boarding houses along Phoenix, that uh, uh, Route 66 original route. And she is definitely one of my heroes. I think she's a pretty tough lady. She was the Betsy Ross of the Arizona State flag. She ended up of uh, her future husband was at a rifle competition. Arizona did not have their own state flag. Uh, they wrote a letter back to you. Do you think you can uh, make this image, sew this image of what we think the Arizona state flag should look like? And actually that original flag is at the state cup capital as I understand it now. So, her house, her small little house that has a lot to say about her as a seamstress and a photographer where the back of it was added on to that represents some of that. It is proposed to be demolished associated with some new construction, uh, preserving the rooming houses that her mother ran, but making sure that we collect that information, know about her, communicate that information, and then make sure that there's some sort of interpretive plaque associated with this woman. We're very aware of our Route 66 uh, projects. Uh, here at the Whispering Winds, we actually have funding from our bed tax uh, funds, and we recreated based on the missing component, we recreated uh, this sign, and they've been working on uh, getting this retro motel open to the public, which is a very unique thing. I think. My time decades in Butte, Montana. Um, this is another example of how you can communicate uh, what that history and translate that history. So the Granite Mountain Speculator fired June 8th, 1917, still the hard, worst hard rock mining disaster in the country where 168 men lost their lives. I was able to design this framework where we plugged in artwork, also plugged in funding, which were customized bricks to talk about how heroic and what an interesting story this uh, was. Uh, it's become a really important site for people to visit. It's the second most visited site in Butte, Montana. It has written interpretation and artistic interpretation and also uses uh, those round uh, granite, uh, those are actually core samples that they use to test uh, where the ore was in the underground. It's become an important part of, of uh, Butte, Montana, and books have been written about it. It's an absolutely fascinating story with, that should be turned into a movie. So a lot of heroes uh, came out of this whole incident. Here's a fun one with labor history. Um, you did end up, we worked on uh, making a labor history landmark, a little uh, fight between two union factions and they went up to a mine and tossed sticks of dynamite into the building until they collapsed it. And you have onlookers thinking that's kind of neat. How do you interpret something like that? Um, this was kind of fun, designed a little collapsed building associated around the remnants of one of the granite steps. Um, 
the there was actually still bad feelings about this all the way into the 80s where they brought in federal uh, National Guard troops and the unions weren't too happy about that. And this was actually a healing project where National Guard and uh, the BRIC uh, union, the Masons Union got together and built this small little monument that I got to design. How do you interpret something on a Superfund site in the smelter city of Anaconda that's 20 miles away from Butte that you can't visit? How do you get an idea of the scale of something like this? This is uh, how it ended up with the, the top being the size, that round area at the top of the smokestack, and then the base of the uh, Anaconda uh, smokestack that exists. Uh, you can actually fit the Washington Monument inside of that smelter stack. And then don't worry about ever making crazy suggestions. So one day I was talking to Jack here and they were talking about a super fun uh, cap to one of the smelter, older smelter sites in Anaconda. I said, well, why don't you use the smelter slag to uh, make sand traps? That's actually what's at the Old Works Golf Course. So I thank you for that. A uh, picture of me, a little younger, in the snow in Butte, Montana, below zero some time ago. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it. Um, feel free to stop sharing your screen. Um, there, did I do it? No. There, there we go. Um, thank you again. I learned so much. Um, now we will be starting our Q&A portion. If anyone has any questions that they would like to put in the chat. Um, one question that we had was regarding the camels and do you know of any other camel trails like that within the United States or is that a pretty unique situation? Arizona did have, uh, did use camels. There was a realization of that, that they were kind of the perfect uh, vehicle early on in this harsh climate. So other places in Arizona did uh, utilize camels. But I, I think it's the fact that the military used camels was, was a very interesting thing and that they were true believers in that. And just the irony of the fact that camels were from North America and that they returned and they were being used at a time, I think was a very unique thing, which I yeah. found fascinating. So. Yeah, I don't hear too much about that. Um, I put the link to the City of Flagstaff Heritage Preservation Resource Center in the chat, um, but is there, anywhere else that we can go to get more information on the topics that you mentioned today? Well, we got the recording of this and again, it's pretty extensive and it needs to be uh, written down more and that comprehensive history needs to be done. Um, I guess I, I put in our, our link, if people need assistance, more than willing to help other CLGs in thinking about uh, what to do with their historic information and how you can share that uh, more directly with the public. And I certainly encourage um, other communities to, to really take that to heart that um, the whole idea of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act is to go through that consultation process, record correctly what is found and what's impacted, but also make sure that that isn't put on a shelf, that it's actually utilized and returned to the public in a very positive way. And, and it has been proven, I have found it in, in my case, that it becomes a very important economic driver when you preserve and share that with visitors and with the community itself. We have a- Oh, there's Sarah. Yeah, look at, look at Sarah's there. Um, Sarah Dector is my supervisor here in Flagstaff. So she has a she has a link there too. So Great. the NAU special collections. It's helpful. 
Um, we had another question in the chat asking, are there any plans to do some projects in Flagstaff that are similar to the ones in Montana that you showed? Yeah, so that one uh, that I showed on that uh, bridge rebuild, that is a Section 106 compliance that I've been working with uh, for the Army Corps engineers that's doing Section 106 and interpreting those impacts by the loss of that uh, trestle. And uh, that uh, is just one that we're working on. We have a lot of projects coming in our way and trying to figure out a way to balance out uh, mitigation and documentation and coordinating all these overlapping projects has been uh, quite an awakening for me recently with uh, some of the projects that have come our way. We have another one mentioning the Museum of Northern Arizona. And um, I'm, not sure, I'm guessing they're referencing the presentation or if they would like links to that, we can find those they're, as well. But. They're not being staffed right now. So if there's anybody that can assist with uh, keeping that facility going full speed ahead, um, that would be important. That's, that's what we know about it right now is that um, it's not currently being staffed from the last thing I heard. So. Um, I see, a, is the trestle going to be moved? No, um, it, it is, um, you know, a, a component. It was considered uh, an important historic resource. It's been rebuilt, added on to a lot of times. And actually, you know, with railroads, uh, they use that uh, creosote material. So as far as being, you know, environmentally safe to move somewhere else, that was some of the process that we went through in Section 106, that the reality of avoidance was not possible with the flood control project of rechannelizing the reel back to where it should be instead of going and dumping it into the ethnic community, which is what took place. So um, that that's how we went through that consultation process, which is super important. You know, again, communication with SHPO early, talk about avoidance, see what the issues are. If it can't be preserved, uh, go through that uh, negotiation, figure out what you're going to do, and then do some form of mitigation. And again, my preference is uh, mitigation. So I see a dark sky ordinance. We definitely have a dark sky ordinance. We actually have a full-time staff person that monitors our dark sky and uh, uh, goes and views sites, uh, works with commercial properties. And again, we're preserving the dark sky uh, as a cultural resource uh, for the Lowell Observatory that's uh, immediately adjacent to uh, town and also for uh, the observatories that exist both west and uh, kind of southeast of town. And I should I should mention that uh, Lo the Lowell site is a National Historic Landmark District, and only three percent of about three percent of historic districts are national landmarks. So I've had a chance to work in three national landmark or be associated with three national landmarks. So it's really important to fully know what your history is and how important it is to national history. There was a second part of that question asking if it was the first in the nation. That is what the information I have. So yeah, first international dark sky city. Again, clearly linked to observatories and maintaining that dark sky. We had another question asking if, could you talk more about the May Hicks house and its demolition? Yeah. Um, you know, again, as everybody knows, in preservation, uh, property rights are maintained. So um, there is a piece of land that's available to uh, build uh, new housing and a commercial space underneath. Uh, they did respect uh, her mother's uh, houses, uh, her rooming houses, the two that are to the west on Phoenix, and integrating that with uh, the preservation of, of the Hicks rooming house. Again, uh, May's house, pretty small, pretty conservative. Uh, floodway issues, being able to put the whole property there. 
So it pains me when we lose properties, but we do go through that process, which is very much similar to section 106, where you ask about avoidance, you ask about moving the house, you look at the condition, it was offered to be moved. Um, there were no takers uh, on that. So um, it, I believe it will be demolished and the mitigation is uh, interpreting that at the new building site of some form of interpretive plaque. And again, I've shared some of this information uh, with various people on how important she is and, and what an interesting woman she was. So she's definitely one of my heroes of, of late. Um, I guess with that, we had another question asking, were the Trestle and May Hicks house documented by photos and measured drawings? Oh, um, there's something about the Museum of Northern Arizona versus Pioneer Museum. Um, you're right. So it's the Pioneer Museum that's having uh, issues on staffing. So I just wanted to correct that. So, and again, yeah, we do have uh, uh, requirements within our ordinance. Uh, municipal code that we have extensive recordation. So we pulled out that research, found new stuff about May, uh, fleshed out that information and did uh, drawings of what that house and photo documentation of that house. So we have that recordation that exists. Again, it's not a, it's a privately funded project. It has no link to uh, state or federal funding, so it's not a section 106 process, but our internal uh, uh, aspects of our municipal code require that we go through that process and produce cultural resource studies. We have another minute if there's any more questions. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, certainly put my email in there. I'll answer any other questions and point you toward other resources along the way. Um, thank you, Mark, and thank you all for attending. Um, reminder that this webinar was recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel, which is Arizona Historic Preservation. I'll put that in the chat. Um, be sure to attend our next webinar, which is on February 7th on rediscovering Camp Naco and creating story maps. Wait about another day for the registration link to be updated. Um, and then our first book club event will be the same week on February 9th, where we will be discussing the book, How the, World, How the Word is Passed. Keep an eye on our social media for more information on that. And the, the, that information will also be on our webinar and or on our website and in the chat. And thank you all, and I hope you have a great day.